Um, hello. 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 <laughs> I guess we should start by saying thank you for coming and um, welcome. I'm Anna and this is Juliet. Um, so we're the people who put this together, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really pleased you're all here and we've got people from really, really quite far away. So thank you for those epic journeys. Um, and we've got people from all sorts of different disciplines, academic disciplines, but also different practitioners and um, people who work in nursing as well who are doing PhDs. So it, it's a real, hopefully a really exciting mix. Um, so I, I, before we start, it's probably worth asking, is everybody OK with... I'm not sure I'm OK with it being <laughs> that close to my face. <laughs> But is everybody okay with being filmed? It's not going to be, we just might use it for the website if we create it for this grant and it'll go in our digital archive, but that's it. It's not going to be sort of sold on. Nobody would want to see this sold on. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? If, you, if you're if you not happy with it, just let me know and we can put a black strip across your face or something. <laughs> we'll sort something out. Um, I thought it might be a useful thing. What we're going to do for the next hour really is kind of um, the naffly titled uh, research speed meeting. Um, but yeah, just because obviously I know a bit about all of you, but you don't necessarily all know each other. So what I thought we'd do is uh, Juliet and I will introduce the sort of background of the grant, um, where the idea came from, um, the tone and nature of the two events, because um, I think we've got quite a strong sense of the style and atmosphere we'd like this to be. Um, what's going to happen over the next 12 months and then what's going to happen today and then I thought we'd go around <clears throat> one by one and just say a bit about um, just sort of three or four minutes each saying who we are, where we've come from, how your research or practice or work relates to this area and just a couple of questions that you have that you'd like this network to explore or things you're currently thinking about. Um, does that sound okay? Yes? Um, so I guess the project <laughs> came about. Um, I was, did my PhD and one of the chapters in that was looking at the last 30 years, really since the 1983 Mental Health Act, looking at um, contemporary theatre practice and how there's a sudden proliferation of representations of madness and psychiatric spaces in the last sort of 30 years and what that's about, why that happens, what the ethics of that, what the politics are of that. And then um, during the course of that, met Juliet. Um, she was doing stuff about um, service user and different forms of knowledge exchange about um, madness and mental health. So we met very briefly then. Um, and then my another chapter of the PhD looked at a British uh, mental health service user theatre company. So I went and did some field work with them. And so I had this, this long-standing interest, basically, in that, this kind of area of performance. Um, and went into the mental health, I don't know if you're aware of the Mental Health Media Testimony Archive at the BL, and started to look at the, their basic, if you don't know, it's interviews with people who are, um, who basically spent their whole lives in and out of asylums um, and wanting to document that history before it disappeared from architectural and living memory. Um, and all my family work in mental health. So I was brought up in and around those kind of environments and was aware that asylums were designed as discrete social spaces, so did have theatres. And it struck me that there's this huge theatrical history that has taken place that is as yet undocumented. Um, and there's obviously lots of current work in applied theatre as well, but there just seems to be plays about these spaces, plays in these, and it's this huge history that I began to think was quite interesting, really. <clears throat> but I thought, me thinking about this on my own is not that interesting. Well, it is interesting, but it would be far more interesting to get a load of people from different backgrounds to come and share what they think about this kind of work. Um, so that's basically where it came from and then I got a job and got told I had to apply for a grant so <laughs> this seemed like um, a good way to combine what I have to do and what I'd really like to do um, so then I got in touch with back in touch with Juliet and we began to hatch mm. this plan yeah. is that an accurate 
think so, yeah. Summary? Um, In a nutshell. Yeah. So it just seems like a really exciting and rich area from a sort of historical, political, theatrical, all sorts of angles. So I thought, let's get people who are also interested in this together in a room and see what happens. And as you can probably tell, <coughs> this is where it comes to the, the tone of the event. Um, we very much want this to be a sort of collaborative, informal, exploratory process, really. We don't have, obviously, we don't have the answers, but we don't even have all the questions yet, which is why we wanted to gather people here today and say, well, what do you want to know about this? What interests you? And think about the things that we then carry forward over the next 12 months and beyond, really. Um, so, yeah, very much group-led. Um, and hopefully not one area dominates this group so hopefully that will foster dialogue that is that people feel able to say well this is where i'm coming from and this is what i think about it rather than feeling like well i don't know that discipline and so i can't contribute so i'm hoping that it'll be quite fruitful in that sense um and like i say this is very much the beginning of this grant but i would hope that it's also the beginning of a longer term um series of events because like i don't think we will cover everything that they is to cover in this area in the next 18 months. Um, so we've got this one event today, which is very much practice focused, looking at current work um, that is taking place in and about psychiatric spaces and thinking about pathology and performance. Um, and then that will be followed up next September um, at Corpus Christi in Cambridge with a two day, um, that'll be a more, perhaps a more straight academic conference. And we've got Kay Redfield Jameson, who's going to be our keynote. And hopefully some of the comedians from Stand Up For Mental Health, which are a Canadian-based company, are going to come over. And that's as far as we've got with the plan at the moment. So again, September? pardon? What, what month did you say? September, yeah. Are we 20th and 21st? We should know this. Um, yeah, it's around them. We'll check um, during the course of the day. But it'll be a two-day conference. It would be great if you could come and contribute. But we'll, <laughs> at that stage, we'll open it up to the wider academic and performance communities and invite other people to contribute papers and things. Um, but in the interim, this is something we'll hopefully talk about later in the sort of roundtable discussion, is what do we want to happen in the next 12 months? We, we can have a website and things like that, but is there a blog? Is there sharing? How, how do we want this network to, to function? How, what, what's the shape of it? Um, is there anything else on that? Oh, and um, another thing that I think would be good to discuss later is the book. So it would be great to have input into, again, the shape of how you imagine the, the sort of publication outcome of this being. So we were talking just this morning about um, hopefully trying to include academic articles, but also um, in the tea break later, I've got put together a slideshow of uh, photographs of asylums. It'd be great to include some of those and perhaps some um, script extracts and interviews and to have it as a slightly more dynamic book. So that's something, again, we can talk about later. Um, I don't know if you want to... Um, I can tell you the conference dates. Yes. <laughs> so it will be the 17th and 18th of September next year, which is the Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and so the plan was to go for um, uh, a full day on the Monday, the 17th, and then probably have half a day on the 18th as well. Um, but as Anna says, we we're quite keen to go for I mean for, for sort of something which um, approaches the sort of the normal kind of standards academic template of a conference, if you like, for that, but hopefully with some other um, angles as well, so perhaps some exhibitions, perhaps, you know, some, some things that follow up on, on what we're, we're doing here today. Um, but no, I think you've covered all that nicely. Um, in terms of today, you've obviously all got um, a schedule, so it's the research speed meeting, then we've got a panel. Um, at half past eight last night, I got an email from Mark Davis, who's the archivist at Hyroids, to say that he wasn't able to come anymore. So he was scheduled to speak um, in Rebecca's panel and now isn't. Um, so what, there's, there's two options. Um, either we can watch 
um, a DVD that I was going to screen in the lunch hour called Cracking Up, which is a documentary about stand-up for mental health. Um, or I can do a paper, um, which was I did have to put it together last night, it's based on previous research, about um, a project that I was involved in with Stepping Out, the mental health service user company, and a project they did in a medium secure unit, and I put that in dialogue with um, a Peter Brook play called The Man Who, so you can either watch a video or um, we can have that paper, so it's up to you what you would... The third option is to look at the photographs and discuss those, so I'm sorry that there's a last minute change, but does anyone have a preference? How are we voting? I wouldn't mind at lunchtime just having lunch. So if you move the film forward, that would. Yeah? Work for yeah. Me. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Everybody's happy with that. Okay. The other option. No, let's just do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we've got uh, the second panel, which is Julie McNamara and Keith Palmer. Tea and photographs. And then we've got a performance from. Analog, which will be great, called 2,401 Objects. Uh, brief discussion. The, at that point, other people will be coming in, not lots of people, but a few other people from the university are coming in to watch. And then we'll have a post show discussion and then a round table discussion. Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm. um, any problems, just grab Erin or Juliet or I. Um, so if we now start just introducing ourselves and a bit about your background and like I said where you're coming at this research from and your questions um, like I said I did my I finished my PhD in 2009 um, and then came to Exeter in January 2010 but my PhD was on um, contemporary theatre practice health and ethics and looking at how in the last 30 years there is a a proliferation in representations of um, pathology and health um, and like I said what the ethics and politics of that representational practice is. Um, so I looked at mental health service users, older people, people who've been sexually abused and people with learning difficulties and also looking at companies that are comprised of those groups and what kind of practice they're doing and what the ethics of, of that kind of work is as well. Um, so it was interested in how you translate um, private experience and pathology into stage material um, and questions of voice because one of the central arguments of it was that people with, um, for want of better phrasing and something we can trouble, um, mental or cognitive impairments are differently stigmatised to those with physical impairments so there is a distinction there and um, they are invalidated voices, they're not trusted as authors of their own subjectivity to varying degrees and so theatre performance is an interesting form for that renego political renegotiation of voice and visibility. So that's basically what the PhD was about um, and like I said um, one of the chapters was with, on oh, sorry, Stepping Out Theatre Company um, which Steve Hennessy, you've got a copy of a, uh, some scripts there. Steve Hennessy is the artistic director of that company, but it's a Bristol-based uh, mental health service user collective that's been going for about 15 years now. And um, I did research on a project. They do a large-scale production every year where every member of the company, if they want to be involved, can be involved, which is quite a feat of sort of engineering to write a play that can feature 35 bodies on stage. Um, of huge sort of varied ability and, and interest and commitment. So um, they did a play called Seven Go Mad in Thebes. And what, that's what they often do. They take a sort of Shakespeare or Greek tragedy and, and then rework that, um, but always with a mental health theme. So they um, looked at Seven Go Mad in theme, Thebes in relation to the Leros scandal in the early 90s and the asylums there. Um, and we took that into, um, well, in and around hostels in Bristol, but also into Froomside Medium Secure Unit and did performances there. Um, so that was my first involvement with them, and then I've stayed involved with that company, and now I'm the trustee and secretary of that company. So they're very interesting. They continue to make work. And Steve also writes independently, so he, that's a quartet of four plays about Broadmoor <coughs> uh, based on his historical and archival research. 
there and he wanted to be here today but he's in London because the show's on so he can't be but he'll hopefully come along to the to the next one. Um, the other I guess way that I've been involved in this is um, I also work as a theatre director and have directed things like um, The Wonderful World of Dissocia and 448 Psychosis etc um, and that raises directing those has raised really interesting questions for me in terms of madness and performance and emotional excess and authenticity um, and and authority to speak and those are interesting questions as well that I would like to explore in the course of this. Um, I guess the final thing that relates to this is I'm writing a monograph at the moment which is about um, madness and performance uh, since 1959, so since the 1959 Mental Health Act to, to 2007 which looks at that period, has a large introductory chapter which maps the sort of political developments of that period and the historical developments and performance developments and the, what happens in mental health as well and maps, because those histories actually map very interestingly onto one another. Um, so looking at the changes of um, dramaturgy really and how that relates to um, changes in care practices and care spaces, etc. And then I move on to thematic chapters with case studies, so um, suicide um, asylums, etc. Um, so that's what I'm working on. And then my questions, I guess, for this um, to start with are very simple and vast, I suppose. What, what kind of work has taken place in and about asylums since, for argument's sake, or since the, well, really the 20th century? Um, and I'm interested in the move from asylums to hospitals to community-based structures, how the shift in architecture and care practices interacts with performance work both in and about these spaces. So um, how has space and performance been put in dialogue? And I've talked for about four days now, so, <laughs> um, so that's, yeah, that's me. Um, well, uh, yeah, as Anna said, I'm, I'm Juliet, uh, and um, I'm a social psychologist, um, and my background really, my, my interest has always been in, um, in forms of knowledge, really, uh, and in different forms of knowledge um, about uh, whatever we come into contact with uh, in, in society. I'm interested in how forms of knowledge develop, how they change, um, how different social groups subscribe to different forms of knowledge, how knowledge comes into conflict um, with other forms of knowledge, uh, how it interacts uh, and so on. Um, and broadly speaking a lot, of, a lot of my work has looked at how people understand mental health problems, mental illness, madness, whatever we want to, to call it, um, through, through the ages. Um, and I've, I've got, well I've had sort of three main areas of interest um, within that really. Um, a lot of my work um, has looked at how people who've been diagnosed with a mental health problem and are using mental health services understand <coughs> mental health and illness, uh, how they develop that knowledge um, and the implications of that knowledge um, as they interact um, with other people in those services, uh, with mental health professionals in particular, uh, with members of the general public uh, as well. Uh, and um, uh, I published a book in 2007 uh, called Journeys Through Mental Illness, which um, looked at, at a big project I'd done uh, in three mental health services. It was um, an ethnographic study um, that also had some interviewing, actually looking at uh, um, how um, uh, the people in these mental health services were developing their understandings um, and looking at the, the, the ways, the very important ways in which those understandings differed from um, the professionals with whom they were coming into contact and the implications of that. Um, so that's been a big area of my work. Uh, but um, uh, I'm also very interested in the way mental health problems uh, have been represented uh, by other interest groups and in other um, uh, fora as well. Um, I've done a project, uh, especially on um, media representations, um, <coughs> when the, the then proposed changes to the Mental Health Act were being discussed. Um, I did a, um, a study looking at the different ways in which these changes were discussed in the media uh, and the different ways in which um, uh, different representations of, of, of mental health problems which were circulating um, in relation to those. Um, so that, I guess, stems or kind of feeds more into the, into sort of the idea of the way the general public 
uh, understand you know what what mental health problems uh, are uh, and then I've also done some stuff more recently actually which I guess goes more into looking at how professionals might understand uh, mental health as well um, I had a paper published last year which was on um, a study looking at the way at uh, the big differences and there are very big differences whether you're analyzing it qualitatively or quantitatively uh, in uh, the way that um, psychiatric medication is advertised in professional journals compared with non-psychiatric medication mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that as I say starts to feed into to some of the uh, kind of the professional um, ideas um, as well um, and so when I was thinking about um, what all of that kind of brings to um, my interest uh, in this project, I think it really is about thinking about these different interest groups um, again. Um, I mean, as Anna says, I think one of the big questions that I've got to start off with, um, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in what went on um, in, with regards to theatre in the old um, asylums, in these big psychiatric um, hospitals. Uh, and I think one of the questions that we've had right from the start is that, you know, we're not really sure what went on uh, and how, you know, whether this is even a question actually that, you know, I mean, what, what we're actually going to find from this. Um, so I'm particularly interested in, in what went on from the patient perspective, from the, the perspective of the staff, but also possibly from the perspective of the wider community as well. I mean, we've called this isolated acts, but were these completely isolated acts? We talk a lot about how, um, you know, um, asylums were these, these little societies in their own right, kind of cut off from, from the wider community. Um, but some of the preliminary work I've done so far um, has possibly suggested that some of these theatrical events could actually have almost had a, a sort of a wider audience. So, um, uh, one of the um, uh, archives I've come across so far for one of the um, asylums in Essex um, uh, suggests that there was an annual pantomime that actually members of the community would come in to the sort of the asylum pantomime, and I'm fascinated by that. Just you know what what this means. You know what does this what does what does, what did theatre what did these productions mean for the patients? What did they mean for the staff? And what role might they have had in the wider community? Um, and from my perspective, as I say, especially kind of feeding into this whole idea of thinking about understandings of mental health problems, you know, how did they contribute to the way that people might have understood um, madness at that particular um, point? So that's, those are kind of the questions I've got, the kind of the what, what happened, why did it happen, and the effects that it might have had on, on understanding. Um, what I'm hoping to do um, as part of this uh, is, is sort of twofold. Um, I think at heart, as well as being a social psychologist, I'm probably a bit of a social historian, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing some uh, archive research and really trying to, to find out what might have, have gone on uh, here. There's a fantastic archive uh, at Cambridge University Library uh, called The Hunter Collection, which has got a lot of records of um, old asylums, so I'm going to get to grips with that see what I can find uh, and then I'm also going to do something hopefully which and again I have no idea whether this is going to work or not uh, but I'm going to put out a kind of a general call uh, in some publications just to try and get anybody who has any memories whether it's whether they were patients or whether they were staff or whether they may have been you know kind of living you know near an asylum or whatever to if they have any memories of any kind of productions that they would like to share with me to try and, and, and get people to, to do that as well so those are the two things that I'm planning on doing uh, over the next year as part of this um, which hopefully will lead to me being able to, to say something in a year's time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it may not uh, but, but that's kind of where I, where I come from uh, in this Thanks. I thought for too long as well <laughs> there we go Erin? Uh, my name's Erin and I'm here a little bit as a poser I think I'm a, a PhD <laughs> student in the department I'm about to enter the third year of my PhD in applied drama um, and my PhD looks at work with young people. So I'm sort of on the periphery of the subject area. I'm, I'm primarily here today as administrative support. So if you need help finding something, I'll probably want to flag. Um, but just as you were talking just now, I've been thinking a lot about um, issues of mental health with young people and, and how often they crop up in any kind of sort of devising work that you do with them. I'm also the artistic director for Devon Youth Theatre. Um, and I just think there's some really interesting resonances, actually, uh, that, that I'm going to spend today thinking about in terms of how, how young people are impacted by the mental health system, but also undiagnosed mental health issues amongst young people, and how artistic exploration can really start to, to get at some of those things in a way that I don't think anything else can. So that's what I'll be sort of into today. But if you need anything at all, 
um, feel free to, to ask. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca Lout. Um, I'm going to be talking in a minute, so I won't say too much, but um, I'm a part-time senior lecturer here in the department, and I also co-run a theatre company based in Reading called Red Cape, um, and we are a, a physical visual theatre company. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the piece that we made <coughs> in 2008 called The Idiot Colony. Uh, so, yes, I suppose the questions that I've got relate to relate to the work that, I'm, that I've been doing and the ways I'm thinking about the work that I've done in terms of what, what kind of creative processes um, can we use and are best used to talk about some of these issues. Um, and the physical language that we that, that we've been developing in our company um, use, uses minimal text, does use some text, but but what are the issues around that? And um, yeah, how do we how do we engage with with kind of factual factual material, but also obviously people's stories, people's voices as theatre professionals? Um, obviously, what are the ethics of that? Um, and how do we how do we work with people um, to to kind of create those stories and then, and then what happens after when the piece is kind of out there in the public. So all, all of those things really. Um, hello. <coughs> so I just come down from the Edinburgh Festival so I had to write down who I am because uh, <laughs> it's been a very long month so sorry I scripted myself. Um, so uh, my name is Liam Jarvis, I'm the co-director and co-founder of a company called Analog. We have the great privilege of performing for you this afternoon next door a uh, show that we just brought down for the Edinburgh Festival called 2,401 Objects. Um, uh, the company is an affiliate company of the National Theatre Studio and we're associate artists at a art space called Farnham Maltings in Surrey. Um, the company is led by myself, my co-director Hannah Barker and a producer called Rick Watts. We've been creating work together since about 2007, uh, devised uh, visual and physical work. Um, and um, our work often involves cross-form collaborations with professionals from all kinds of different disciplines. So the last four years have seen us working alongside neuroscientists, neuroanatomists, histopathologists, social psychologists, pervasive media experts and computer aided 3D modelling experts. Um, I've been thinking a bit about the work that we've made over the last uh, four years and how it resonates with some of the things that we've been talking about so far. Uh, and it strikes me as an awful lot of resonances. The first show that we made is a show called Mile End, which was based on the uh, true life story of a mental health patient called Stephen Soames Wade, um, who, um, after giving numerous warnings uh, to medical health professionals that he was uh, needed to be sectioned and was going to uh, kill someone in order to be sectioned, uh, wasn't listened to, and in 2002 he pushed uh, an unsuspecting commuter in front of an oncoming tube train at Mile End Tube Station. So much of our uh, work around that story was to do with research alongside uh, charitable organisations like SANE, which is a schizophrenic um, charity, uh, and a number of mental health organisations and people who've had personal experiences being touched by um, such disorders. Uh, our second show was a show called Beachy Head, which was an exploration largely into a telephone box was installed on the cliff tops of Beachy Head, which is a prominent uh, suicide spot in the UK, uh, with a Samaritan sign next to it uh, in 1976. Uh, and so the show was uh, largely about trying to understand the people that found themselves on the cliff tops in the phone box, their stories, the unknowability of their stories, working largely alongside organisations like the Samaritans, um, and again, a number of other mental health organisations. And then most recently we've been working on 2,400 Objects, which is the show next door, which is a, a show uh, for which we collaborated with a, a neuroanatomist called uh, Jacopo Inese, um, who is with us this afternoon, but only audibly re a recording of him. Um, and he, uh, in 2009, uh, very famously dissected live on the internet, uh, in 2009, uh, the world's most famous amnesic patient, Henry Meliasson, who underwent very crude... Uh, experimental brain surgery in 1953 in which he had his hippocampi removed, leaving him with two years of uh, memory loss before the operation and uh, retrograde memory loss and the inability to ever form any new memories, anterograde memory loss. Um, so we've become particularly interested in, uh, and our research for the last two shows has been funded by the Wellcome Trust, the biomedical organisation in the UK with an interest in collaborations between scientists in hard sciences 
uh, and soft sciences and artists. So we've been working a lot through that organisation, um, asking a lot of questions surrounding the ethics of medical procedure um, and researching uh, previous medical practices in relation to contemporary medical practices, which I'm pleased to say are um, significantly less crude than the 1950s uh, neuroscience. Um, as well as um, running a theatre company, I also am uh, a visiting lecturer at Royal Holloway, uh, University in London, and I'm a PhD candidate. Um, there are some crossovers with my research, although it's slightly different, but my research is largely to do with participatory performance um, that, that asks um, something, um, something very particular of an audience member, asks them to contribute to the content of the work. Um, and I'm interested to use neuroscientific tools of analysis to try and understand what that means. Uh, particularly in relation to uh, contemporary neuroscience that uh, suggests that our free will is something that is epiphenomenal. I'm interested in artistic practices that are giving us um, more opportunity to express ourselves freely. And is this, I'm interested to question whether this is something that has emerged as a result of the limits to our freedom that neuroscience is telling us about. Um, but I suppose I'm also very interested in the, um, the impact of participatory work um, and this difficult thing, the, the, the whole that we put the audience into to experience work. People coming with different experiences, traumas, um, uh, different levels of mental health, and the complex ethical questions that are, are, that are raised with participatory work. So that's something that I'm particularly interested to find out more about. So I think it's very good to you now as well. Uh, hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my name's Keith Palmer. I'm not gonna take too long because I'm going to um, have a chance to speak with you later on. I, I'm actually just interested um, and wanting to hear and understand how humour is used in the mental health world and uh, get a sense of what's out there and what people are, are doing really. So that's my interest uh, today uh, and uh, I'll tell you a bit more later on really. You keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, and I've just come back from a You're video. not done, are you? <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing then? Tell you later. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Julie McNamara. I'm a mental health system survivor, mad woman made good. And I work with a small theatre company called Vital Exposure, basically embracing those voices who have been marginalised over the years. Um, I've been in and out of the system myself for too long. Um, I lived and worked in an asylum for two years. And the last piece of work we've done, we've developed over the last two years, uh, is based on the authentic survivor testimony of people who lived in a, a cluster of asylums known as the Hertfordshire Cluster, um, six big bins, which was the overspill outside London for our social reject. Um, I make mischief on stage is what I do, but I make sure that people get a chance to reclaim their own story, because particularly inside mental health, always our stories are repackaged, either the doctor tells our story, the relative tells our story, or the psychiatric team tells our story, and we're reclaiming it. Okay, I'm Karina, um, I work at Oxford Brookes University where I teach English literature and drama. Um, my main interest in mental health is largely through theatre and science. I'm currently working on a book on theatre and science. But it's something that I find that I keep coming back to. I worked on this area for my PhD, and during my student days, I managed to survive debt free by working in um, an adolescent mental health unit and in a mental health team. So I've had those experiences of seeing sort of patients from you know, the, the kind of mental health team end, but also as somebody who has a family member with PTSD. So I feel in some ways inherently fascinated by theatre's power to represent mental illness and also feel kind of passionately interested in the political, social, ethical and moral elements of what we do as theatre practitioners and as theatre academics. And I guess what I'm hoping to get from today is um, a sense of engagement with what all of you are doing. So yeah, I'm going to be greedy and listen a lot. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm Susan Coxon from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I want to thank Julia and Anna for inviting me to come. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and, and hearing what all of you are doing. My work um, for the last oh, 10 years or so has been primarily focused on genetics and ethics. I do a lot of work. I'm a sociologist although I work in a small interdisciplinary center uh, that is the Center for Applied Ethics. So I kind of span social science, primarily qualitative kinds of work using narrative and poetry with ethics and focus on a lot of different areas of health research. But my engagement with theater has been relatively recent and I'm on a big learning curve. Uh, the first project I embarked on with a colleague of mine who's a physician and a playwright it was about five years ago. We had funding from Health Canada, which is a major regulatory um, and oversight agency in Canada that governs the drug safety and creates health policy and does a whole bunch of things. Um, we had funding from them and also from our uh, national funding agency that uh, funds all health research to mount a production of a play called Orchids, which is actually a musical. And it was about the uses of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. A very complex kind of procedure that uh, generates a lot of very difficult ethical issues to make health policy around. And so we did this uh, production both in French and English, because Canada is bilingual country, and had performances in Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. And my role with the, the project was to study the audience response to the production and how well it was able to generate for them some appreciation for the complexity of the technical aspects of the, the procedures, but also the political and, and health policy related issues um, that covered the whole spectrum of things from you know, fears of recreating uh, Nazi kinds of approaches to eugenics and use of genetics to create the perfect child, um, to worries about if we were to allow this kind of technology, how would we allow fair access to it because it's very expensive. And this was a project that, as far as I know, still was one of the first to look at how you can use theater to generate health policy. Because Health Canada really wanted the Canadian public's input um, on these very difficult ethical issues before creating new health policy. So I, I was involved in that and very excited about seeing the potential of theater to allow publics to have a say about issues that are very complex and that they actually, you know, we found this out through talking with them afterwards, they probably would have had very little to say were they given a standard lecture or read an article about it or even <coughs> called to do a telephone survey because they didn't think they really understood enough or had enough to say about it. And their exposure to the live theater production changed all of that dramatically so that many of them felt really empowered to get up to the mic and speak about what they thought about the important health policy issues. So I'm very excited about that, that aspect of theater. Um, a second project that I was involved in more recently uh, was a pilot project that used um, both theater and poetry, visual art, dance, and music um, to kind of weave together uh, a 35 minute piece that was a representation of the voices of people who were volunteers in all different kinds of health research. They were the, the guinea pigs in the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, and I had interviewed in another project a great many of these people. And we were exploring the uses of um, these many arts-based <coughs> methods of disseminating our research findings in new ways. And that was also very exciting and raised a great many uh, challenging ethical issues around co-producing a piece like that. And, you know, who, who owns the stories once several people have worked on them. Um, what is the impact for different audiences of that kind of production when their voices are quite audible threads within the whole piece and they think that's them or they, they're sure that that's them or someone else recognizes that unique phrase that they use and identifies with their story. What kinds of ethical issues does that raise? Um, and now I'm just embarking on a new project, um, which is in very early stages, uh, which has much more to do specifically with mental health and in two ways. Um, one is a residential population 
that is coping with a very complex kind of uh, combination of um, addiction, uh, mental illness, and chronic illness that goes with addictions like alcoholism. Um, and their residential population, and they've got a new program that is allowing them to use a variety of arts-based approaches uh, as healing modalities in that institution. And so they're enacting, um, I haven't met many of these people yet, uh, enacting some of their understandings of their own situation for each other as a, a way of communicating when many of them have been very unable to communicate at all. So I'm very interested in the theater's role in healing in that way and giving voice to and then the other arm of that project is looking at how um, we can use techniques like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Theatre for Living program, and we have someone in Vancouver named David Diamond, and it's very based on that approach, um, amongst mental health workers to reduce their, um, uh, the stigmatization of people with mental illness and trying to improve how they, they treat um, residents in the system and people they encounter with mental health problems through the theater. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to be here because um, you're all doing such fascinating work and uh, it's an area that I really want to move more into. I've done a lot of work in health research for many years and I'm tired of the constraints of the scholarly publication and that whole group and want to have a much uh, bigger impact in the communities where I work in terms of really improving things for people. And I think that theater is just so exciting for that very reason that I've seen what it can do already. And um, so I'm, I'm here and I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this day evolves and where I can make a contribution. Thank you. Um, my name is Carla Nani. I am an architectural historian. So I'm a professor at Rutgers University, which is in New Jersey in the United States. And, um, I am also very inspired by here, uh, what everyone here is working on. Um, I'm interested in the role that architecture plays in the social construction of knowledge. And what I mean by that is if you take a sort of old-fashioned idea of science as value-free and timeless and placeless, this search for truth, um, Within the last, say, 30 years, social constructionist historians of science have undermined that idea and have really concentrated on the way that scientific knowledge is rooted in place, that it, it, it is situated. And as an architectural historian, I take that to a sort of finer degree, which is to really to look at buildings that serve in some way to legitimize knowledge. So my first book was about science museums in Victorian Britain. And my second book was about psychiatric hospitals in 19th century um, America. So um, in both cases, these large-scale public-funded buildings legitimated a whole field of knowledge. So it was natural history in Victorian Britain in the you know, time of, of Darwin and Huxley. Um, and then it, for, the, for the 19th century in the United States, it was really the in, invention of the profession of psychiatry as an extremely powerful profession. Um, so I'm, I'm also interested in the way that architecture or environment more generally influences behavior. And in the 19th century, uh, there was almost a faith that, that these buildings, psychiatric hospitals, could cure, could, uh, that, that the healing power of the buildings and the natural settings or the, and the landscape gardens um, could, could cure a disease. And um, many of you are familiar with that history. Um, for me as an architectural historian, it was very easy to gain access to the doctor's um, perceptions of what <coughs> the asylums were doing and how they worked and what their ideals were. It was much harder for the 19th century to, to get a handle on the, the patient's voices. So one of the things that's so exciting about hearing about all of your work is that the of course, it's easier for the 20th century than the 19th century anyway, but to, the theater is, and literature are, are a way at those patient voices. And so that's, that's very exciting for me to think about. I think this creative approach can, can do that in a way that um, is really exciting. Um, I'm also, a, a question I have or something to explore, I think, that um, kept cropping up in my book about the asylums was, 
the struggle between domesticity and institutionality. That there was all of all these claims about creating a home. The, the asylum superintendent referred to as the father. The patients referred to as family. Um, that and the impossibility of that was in an institutional setting that in some cases had 800 patients, sometimes 1,600 patients. Um, so I think that might be something interesting to, to explore, a sort of myth of domesticity. Um, because in the 19th century, it was believed you had to take the patient out of the home <coughs> in order for them to be cured. At least that was the middle part of the 19th century. Um, so and then my, my final comment is just, it's, it's, so, um, it's so lovely to hear each of you talk about your work. And to think about, I, I feel that I feel that there's a real crisis in the humanities in the United States that that humanities scholars have allowed themselves to become so just dis disconnected from the lives of ordinary people mm -hmm. that state universities are under fire. Um, people have no idea what we ordinary people, if there is such a thing, have no idea what we do or why it's important. And it seems to me there's something wonderful about this project that we can take serious scholarship and presented to people in accessible and and, pr and and important ways and that we're addressing some of the, the most difficult and unsolved social conditions. So <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, um, my name is uh, Richard Stern. Um, I have a long-standing sort of connection with um, psychiatric services. Um, my brother was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 16, uh, I was 14, and since then um, I've worked, uh, I worked for Rethink, the big national, um, schizo well it used to be the National Schizophrenia Fellowship, um, uh, after that um, I, wor I did my training as a psychiatric nurse in Cambridge, um, and worked, uh, well, I have been working in, in London as a psychiatric nurse for about a year. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you probably can imagine I've got fairly ambiguous feelings about um, mental health because I've seen it sort of personally, professionally. Um, and sort of underneath it all, I've always had an interest in literature. Um, and I, I sort of find myself going back to literature now. Um, and I want to do a PhD literature which I'm going to begin uh, in London um, in uh, well, the end of this month uh, and that's going to be about um, the late 18th century and the influence um, of, of madness really as, as a sort of all, all, uh, catch-all term um, and how that affects in particular late 18th century poetry and I'm looking at um, William Blake, William Cowper um, and Christopher Smart in particular. Um, and I, I guess what I'm very interested in today um, is uh, the ethical difficulties really of writing about um, mental health. Um, if, if you go to the Morsley Hospital in London, uh, you, you can see a, a kind of a warning on the, on the, uh, on the corridors which which suggests, you know, that there's been a history of, of kind of ridicule um, of, of people that have been affected by um, mental illness, madness, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and, and I think it's a sort of unresolved issue. Um, and, you know, I have mixed feelings about it, and I'm interested to hear what everyone else thinks about that, really. And, 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 I, and I guess also there's sort of different between personal and professional <coughs> responses to, to mental health. I'm Paul Crawford, and uh, I'm here to be excited, and the day started well, listening to, <laughs> to all these things. Um, I'm Professor Royal Fellow at the Institute of Mental Health. I trained as a nurse, a, a psych nurse, um, and uh, did my PhD in literature, first degree in literature and language. And I went on to set up the Health Language Research Group at Nottingham to bring applied linguistics into healthcare beyond doctor-patient communication, for which, uh, over the last 10 years or so, they gave me a, a personal chair for that work. Um, a lot of my work uh, at the side of 
my day-to-day -day, uh, work, which is in charge of training mental health and learning disabilities nurses across Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire, which if you look on the map is most of the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from that, I'm interested in madness and literature and uh, AHRC uh, gave me some money to set up the madness and literature network, which is madnessandliterature.org now, with over 300 members with a big US U UK link and it's probably the most prominent uh, kind of resource. And maybe we can talk about resource mm -hmm. issues. Um, and more recently, uh, well, I sit on the science and culture panel for the AHRC and I'm also um, kind of uh, one of the co leads, I suppose, for St Pancras Group, which is uh, AHRC. Looking at into animating uh, arts, humanities, and social sciences. Um, as the, the first, I think, professor of health humanities in the world, uh, I kind of thought it would be good to proceed with that program. So, AHRC have funded uh, the International Health Humanities Network, which will have a website, healthhumanities.org, by the end of this year. Um, and that work really is why it's good to be here because uh, that is a, a very large hood looking at how arts and humanities disciplines can inform uh, healthcare, uh, also mental healthcare, mm -hmm. and how that initiative needs to be an evolution away from medical humanities to a more inclusive uh, program of work which includes service users. Uh, professionals, the public, the self-caring and informally caring public, and academics who, uh, who despite Stanley Fish and, and other silly people, um, <laughs> are, these knowledges are very much in, uh, in, important to healthcare practice and health and well-being, and have been for a long time. So it's. Hopefully, humanities will narrate itself better, ironically, uh, in future. Can I just ask you what AHRC means? Oh, sorry, well, it's the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which I think has funded this, this event. Um, it's, it's actually getting, what should I say, there's a fire put under it by the government. I'm sure the same is happening in America, which is, uh, please be relevant. Don't, don't, be, don't be trivial, and, or at least please narrate your relevance. And I think that's the thing, is, is it's catching up now, these funding bodies are catching up with narrating uh, all the brilliant work that's been done through arts and humanities, which has changed lives. But we just didn't bother to narrate that, particularly well. I'm Sarah, I'm uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Marathon County, and I'm just, my mind is just about to explode with all of this. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you to Anna and Juliet for bringing together such a group and for writing grants and so forth. But at any rate, um, I teach theater at a small school, but um, I have a brother who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. When would that have been? <laughs> Mid-70s. So things have you know, changed a lot since then, but perhaps not in the mental health field. And um, I also have um, lost a sister to suicide, um, depression and alcohol, brought on by depression and alcoholism. So I have a very personal, uh, personal relation to this topic. And I guess what got me motivated um, was I just got really sick of portrayals of <laughs> mental illness that were either overly sentimental or insulting or, or um, pat. So um, I had put together a panel some time ago and Ellen Kaplan ended up on this panel, a panel about um, the way that mental illness is treated in theater at a large, and this was at a large, um, probably the largest uh, academic theater conference in the United States, uh, American theater in higher education, and brought together some people and, and really found that this was a, you know, it's kind of like the last taboo. It was kind of like, you know, every, you know, they have splinter groups for everybody, you know, one-legged lesbians, you know. <laughs> 
to juggle, you know, I mean, you know, they had all these very specialized focus groups, but I found this was one area that was really neglected. So together with Ellen, whom I met on that panel, um, put together a book, um, Mental Illness, um, Images of Mental Images Illness. Of mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't even it's remember like that. that. <laughs> but at any rate, so that was kind of an academic start. Um, but then I started working with a clubhouse, and I'm not sure how many of you know what the clubhouse movement is. Mm -hmm. It is an international movement. Mm -hmm. It's um, the clubhouse is actually started in New York once uh, there was a big deinstitutionalization, and a lot of people were cast out into the streets that really should not have been, you know, cast out in the streets and had a lot of um, difficulties. And they, f uh, mental health consumers, formed a clubhouse, which is a place where they could come and um, not like a, not for therapy so much, but to get back in touch with the day-to-day -day routine of the workforce. Um, the, pl for the clubhouses are a resource to connect people with work, um, to train people. Some of the people, um, you know, there's a great variety in terms of um, um, skill and background. Um, some people simply would wor work, to work in the clubhouse, say managing the kitchen or so forth. But we have a small clubhouse in, in the town I live in, Wausau, and I started to do theater with those uh, with, with members of the clubhouse. And the clubhouse mentality, the clubhouse theory is that everyone's a member, whether or not you're a social worker or a, uh, a mental health consumer or um, someone like myself volunteering. And I also was able to bring in a lot of students. So it's the idea of a collective, a collaborative effort. And we worked um, uh, together and we created a script called Taboo or Not Taboo <laughs> and formed a company called Under the Rug Theater. We also, as part of that script, got permission from Pete Early, who's written a book called uh, Crazy, um, which is based on his experience as a father of someone, a mental health consumer, who got caught up in the legal system and really explores how, in the United States, the many people who should be giving, given medical care, psychiatric care, um, end up in, in jails, prisons, where they, um, they deteriorate. Um, so at any rate, we were able to adapt part of his uh, book, and he's given us permission to adapt the whole thing, but <laughs> you know, life got in the way. <laughs> life always gets in the way. Um, so, uh, and I also traveled to Detroit where there's a larger clubhouse where they um, have done some really amazing um, work, some very successful scripts, and uh, done a lot of research. And then most recently, I've been, <coughs> I went back kind of into the academic track and just contributed a chapter to a book called Mental Illness in Popular Culture, which explores the uh, evolution of images of mental illness in the American theater um, and spent, devotes a lot of time to the musical Next to Normal, mm -hmm. um, which is really something that there's a musical <laughs> uh, that, that takes mental illness seriously. So um, I have a lot of questions, um, and one of the things that that I really, and I, I feel guilty that I haven't done more with the clubhouse of late. Um, it was a very difficult situation, and it really raised questions for me when we did this performance. Um, who was it for? Uh, and was my purpose, and my students' purpose, and the clubhouse, all the other clubhouse members, was, we, was it to use theater to get in touch with our own issues, to, um, to gel as a group, or was it to educate people? And there were also a lot of issues that came up, particularly when I interviewed the people in Detroit, about at what point does this become exploitative? Mm -hmm. um, and at what point is it, there was one fellow who had his trauma, and he tried to reenact his own trauma, and it was very, very damaging to him. So, and those are questions that I think a lot of us who work with young actors face all the time, is how much do you push, um, kind of, you know, the method idea, the kind of, you know, before it becomes a violation and dangerous. So, but I'm very excited to be here, and thank you so much to our guests. And I echo that. Thank you very much, and I also am fascinated by everything that people are talking about. I, I, my name's Ellen. I teach acting and directing at Chair Theater at Smith College, which is a women's college in the Northeast. And a good portion of my work, I've I'm a recovering actress, but I direct and <laughs> I, I don't act anymore. But I do direct and I'm a playwright. And a good portion of my work since I, for 30 years or more has been in applied theater working with uh, theater and writing with, um, in terms of literacy in prisons, worked with uh, what we call exceptional kids with exceptionalities, meaning mental and, and um, emotional 
exceptional uh, uh, behaviors. So I've done that for many years. So theater as a, a practice outside the building has been part of what I've done. And um, I've written also a good deal about trauma, theater and trauma, um, about very much as I'm thinking about what Sarah just said, about the, what are the dangers of reiterating trauma and what distance is necessary in terms of approaching trauma traumatic material. And I've been interested as well in social trauma, not to, but theater in zones of conflict. And I've worked in many places around the world, a good deal in Israel. And um, I just came back from recently from Sarajevo, where I've been interviewing survivors. And I'm asking myself very much, what are the therapeutic, what for? I, I, I'm writing a piece at the request of the people uh, who invited me as survivors. But what is that? Is there a therapeutic value to that? Is there historical value to that? What am I doing? And I need to answer those questions for myself, ethically, as much as anything else as I continue with this work. Um, the two other things that, that are on my mind now in terms of my present work, one is that I'm teaching a class in prison on women and violence uh, with half Smith students and half incarcerated women. And issues of violence and what that is what we act out and the continuum within all of us very important to me. Mental illness also touches me very personally. I think that my mother was um, diagnosed untreated and extremely abusive and my brother also suffers. Um, but I say this because it's informed, kind of surreptitiously informed my work in other words, unbeknownst to myself for much of what I write, I go, oh, look what I'm writing about. What a surprise. <laughs> um, but I've started on a new piece, and the piece is probably the most personal, a new play uh, that I've, I've begun, but it's very much about diminished responsibility or not. It's about, uh, a, a, based on a true story, about a young woman who uh, was seriously abusive of her young child, who was ultimately taken away from her. And... Um, at what point does her illness no longer excuse her actions to very seriously hurt her 10-month-old child to ultimately be taken away? I don't know. And, and so I'm finding myself feeling like I'm stepping into quicksand. And, and so I don't know what my questions are, but they're all around that, and every one of you are addressing them, so thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm Great. Um, remarkable, yeah. Um, I've just been taking notes as I've been going through, and there's such interesting connections about notions of knowledge, I guess, situated knowledge and real and academic knowledge and and, and ownership of knowledge and 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 dialogues between different forms of knowledge, which I guess is kind of what this project is about, but also how more broadly how who who communicates for whom, with whom, and what about, and where those dialogues are taking place, and, and what our respective positions in those dialogues are, either as facilitators or as, or as testifying. And there's something, you know, ethics is the thing that keeps recurring as well, and there's obviously a slight dis-ease about what are we doing and why are we doing it and who has the right to speak, and I think that's really interesting. And questions of participation and intervention and, and the t almost potentially neo-colonial notion of intervening to make better. Mm -hmm. What What is that? Um, and arts and science dialogues as well more broadly and, and ridicule and spectacle. I was really interested, Rich, in what you are saying about um, the corridor and you said there was a warning but I wasn't sure. Yeah, I didn't really express that very well. <laughs> no, um, what was that? I th I th I th there's just a... Well, I, when I say a warning, that's the way I've taken it, I think. Um, but it, 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 there's a poster on, 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 well, there's posters all down the corridors, but one of them is, is, is kind of explaining that in the past, um, stories about um, psychiatric patients associated with the Wardsley Hospital um, you know, have been um, you know, violations, essentially, mm -hmm. of, 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 the, of the patient. Yeah. And, um, and subjecting patients to ridicule, and uh, I think th there's, you know, that is a, an uneasy line. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, there, it strikes me, for example, that there isn't a sitcom about working on mental health. Yeah, I mean, not to my knowledge. Um, and, and yeah, in a way, it's an obvious subject. We've got um, um, Psychoville. 
Yeah, I suppose so, but that's but isn't that's a sitcom, not about but working within services, and yet no. there's so many <coughs> other sort of working within you know a hospital, or working yeah. within uh, the police or other public services. And mm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not aware of one mm. that's ever been done. Maybe there has been, I don't know. But, mm. um, but it, 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 you know, somebody that's worked as a nurse. Um, there's an awful lot of black humour yeah. uh, to, to sort of carry you through w what you're dealing with. Yeah. And, 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 and that's coming from the patients as well, actually, mm. I, would, I would say. Um, in fact, it's, it's often the, the, the best mm. uh, bits of humour <laughs> come, come from the patients. Um, and you know, so in, in, in a way, it seems something that could easily be um, a comedy drama sort of mm. scenario but nobody seems to maybe people don't want to go there but mm. so. there's something interesting as well isn't there about uh, about that humor and 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 who who can laugh you know the author, who has the right to make those jokes and um that goes back to those questions of spectacle and, and sensation to a certain degree so for example, in some of the lullabies of Broadmoor, they, they're talking about sensational cases and what are you doing? And it's again about that ethical obligation. You don't want to be sort of dire and tediously worthy, but what you choose to represent in a, when you're dealing with a group that is st still hugely stigmatised and marginalised, it qualifies it, doesn't it, in some way? that it, is it no holds barred, you can represent what you like? Or is it, do you have to take it? It's something I'm thinking about at the moment, sex abuse, that there's such malign, gross, widespread denial of the prevalence and nature of child sex abuse. So what does that mean that dramatists or artists or whoever has a different ethical obligation in the sense that if you're contributing to a malign denial of something... Is that okay? But then what's the alternative? I don't know. I think these are really knotty ethical questions. It's not too long ago since, you know, the Sun had the headline bonkers, Bruno, you, know, mm. you know, which shows you kind of where some of the sort of values are around mental health are, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about the bonkers Bruno um, headline was the fact that they had to change it and what they, the, changed, it, what they yeah. changed it to um, because of the initial outcry after the first edition was sad Bruno in mental home. And so you've got another, you know, you, you, you might have got away from the mad bit, but you're not getting away from the, you know, the sad, pitiful, these people need help kind of image. So mm. e either way there, you know, um, I thought that was... So I think your American guests have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> There's um, uh, a boxer who was very famous in the kind of 1980s called Frank Bruno, um, who had a fairly kind of dramatic um, breakdown um, and was, um, as it was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And the Sun, which is a tabloid newspaper for anyone again, anybody who's not familiar with it, um, uh, their first headline was "Bonkers Bruno Locked Up." Uh, but there was oh. a real outcry when the first edition came out, uh, and so they changed it about four o'clock in the morning for the later editions to "Sad Bruno in Mental Home." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's a whole question I think around humour because usually it's that thing of what are you laughing at, mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone wants to point the finger and mm -hmm. say. You know, usually you, there's a target, or victim, people like victim, mm -hmm. but usually there's a target. Uh, and I think the uh, reason why a lot of things haven't been in is people don't want to kind of actually say, I'm laughing at mm. you, really, mm. or yeah. whatever it is. So it's, it's that whole question, what are you laughing at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that one needs to kind of answer. And, uh, yeah, one can be self-deprecating, but depending on what environment you're in, is that really going on? Mm -hmm. And if it's going, if it's from a writer writing it, it's, you know, mm -hmm. as in looking in. But I mean, the thing is, like anybody that works within mental health services in mm -hmm. uh, in London, I can tell you. I mean, I've been working in in the acute wards in Lambeth and um, you know Camberwell, and you wouldn't get through the day without you know, <laughs> this really stressful environment. So. But your audience is yourselves. That's right. different. Not necessarily are you going to do that, the same humour that you use in-house, are you going to get up on stage and address other people that, who are not professionals? Yeah, you know? that's the issue, isn't it? I think. Yeah. 
and you're doing something therapeutic in a sense for yourself, which in a different venue could be but, very insulting. But also for, for mm -hmm. everyone involved there, though, like mm -hmm. Stacey, I mean, this, there's mm -hmm. a lot of knowing humor from the patients, you know, oh. they'll, they'll mm -hmm. come up, they'll, they'll start, you know, speaking back with jargon to you, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> I mean, and, you know. Um, but isn't that different, though, still, to then going out and then addressing a group of people who are not part of that institutional environment? Then you'd be doing something, I think, that maybe more dicey ethically. It, it, the same standards don't seem to shouldn't apply no. in house. No. Do you know what I mean? No. Uh, I was, and I, I tried to explain this. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier in a conversation in the foyer. Um, I had a, a friend in uh, graduate school who worked um, in a hospital by day, and then he was on comedy sports, which is you know improvisation for. And he said it really bothered him because he felt like by constantly finding comedy in eccentricity that in a way he was ridiculing certain behaviors that he was surrounded by all day. Not intentionally, but I think that's what makes it very difficult, the, the aspect of comedy and mental illness is the idea that so forever we have found great humor in eccentricity and excess. And, and sometimes, you know, where do you draw a line there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've always been struck by the, the, the border country between, um, if you like, formal theatre uh, and performance and the, the theatre and the performance uh, with, within mental health settings, should we say, not necessarily institutions so much because we have a diffuse service provision. It's quite unusual. Um, but, you know, both service users and also professionals, at various times you, you can observe, not just at the level of humour, but uh, you can see people uh, performing as well uh, in, in, in uh, these unusual situations and settings. Um, and, uh, tra training nurses in, in uh, Nottingham uh, has kind of tuned me in, watching how nurses sometimes are transformed themselves be, uh, between the, the kind of people when they're out in the street and the kind of people they are when they're in a clinical theatre, literally. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. those kinds of crossovers. Mm -hmm. So like treatment is theatrical? Well, well life itself is theatrical and uh, a lot of uh, clinical I, work I, I, is performance. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would second that actually. I mean, I, I can think of a situation of sort of being in um, uh, ward rounds as, as a nurse on the ward and there's um, a consultant psychiatrist who was you know seeing patients individually and there's a, a group of other professionals and I, I can remember the first time I went in there um, and, and I was new to all of the patients um, I was wearing some bright socks and every time um, a new patient came in this consultant psychiatrist pointed to my socks and said what do you think of your socks and then I, and, I, and, I, and I got <laughs> I'm not kidding you, this is actually, you know. And I actually went away from the ward round and I did, I, I'm quite uncomfortable about the, what, what he'd done actually. I thought it was, you know, not, not great really. And it, it did seem to be, uh, you know, like he's performing for the patients. You know. it, did, it did feel like that, to be honest, yeah. Can I be annoying and stop what is a really interesting discussion to move us on? Cause, but it's good because it means that you know, we've all got a lot to say, so we can carry this on for today. But I want to move us on to Rebecca Laux and her paper on the idiot college. Yeah, sorry, Dorinda. Well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here primarily as a documenter. Um, I'm at Exeter. Um, I'm a, a part-time senior lecturer. And uh, I'm also a freelance theatre director and dramaturg. And I'm in the process of setting up a project, the, rel the relevant bit, uh, with the Mood Disorder Unit mm -hmm. in the psychology department here, with a playwright and a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really for three audiences. One is uh, to create an audio-visual installation in the Mood Disorder Unit itself, which is a new building. And another is an online one which uh, A-level students can access, psychology A-level students. And the third audience is a woman's hour um, 
five, it's, it's for, to create five little pieces um, and for Women's Hour on Radio 4. So that, that's the, the only project I can think of that I can say briefly that is, <laughs> that is related to this area. But I'm very, very fascinated by everything everybody has said. So I'm really looking forward to it and learning a lot. Thank you, Tom. Do you want me to turn the... Um under the 1913 Mental Deficiency Act, which classed them as morally defective. And probably a lot of you know about this. Um, so in order to specifically address the themes of, of, of the network, I'm going to concentrate today on two aspects of the devising and performance process. One is the way that we use the notion of a very specific type of performance within asylums, within our piece, and why. 
And, and the second thing is the way that we tried to very clearly evoke a sense of the atmosphere of the asylum. Um, yeah, and, and talk about how, how we did that. So, yeah, I want to start with a letter that we received from an audience member after one of the shows, I think it was from Tunbridge Wells. My mother was a nurse in a long-stay hospital in Kent for many years until its closure. My grandfather drove their bus, my aunt worked in the laundry, and a great-aunt was a senior nurse there before I was born. I'm now 60. Your play perfectly captured the experience of the women that I met through my mother towards the end of the life of the hospital. Louis and Chester were elderly ladies by the time I met them. I believe Louis had been committed for having an illegitimate child. Chester's story I never knew, but on Sundays she would stand behind the railings and when any woman walked past, she would say, here she comes, here she comes. Her mother had long since ceased to visit, but Chester never stopped waiting for her to appear. I never knew their proper names. My mother supported Louis when the hospital closed and Louis was moved to a community house. Mum and Louis were friends until Louis's death a few years later. Thank you for remembering women like Louis and Chester and what they went through. Now the reason that I begin with this letter is because we continue to be extremely moved by the responses we had from people around the country who saw some of their own stories in our work, whether that was a nurse in one of the old institutions, um, uh, as, as, as somebody, one audience member put it, a survivor of the mental health system, or a family member of a patient, or just somebody who knew somebody who was involved in one of these big asylums. We had an enormous amount of positive feedback from people affected by the mental health system. Um, we began work on the piece because we were both inspired and outraged by one particular story that told a tale of a particular period in the history of UK mental health, but that also had a much wider resonance as a story of human rights abuses, the marginalisation and silencing of vulnerable people, and the way that those individual stories have become lost, forgotten, or were simply never told, as, as many of you touched on already. We were trying to be true to an extensive period of research, but also use our training to make an entertaining and engaging piece of theatre that was inspired by real events. So what I'm going to start to try to unpick a bit over the next 20 minutes or so is the process that we went through in order to do this and how the relationship between the research and the creative process evolved into the final piece. Um, so just make a start on that really. Red Cape was founded in 2007 by Claire Cochet, Cassie Friend and myself who'd met during our undergraduate degree uh, studying theatre studies at Lancaster University in 1992. We all went off and did various different things but maintained the desire to work together when the time was right. Um, Cassie trained at Jacques Lecoq's Mime School in Paris and she's also a member of Pig Iron Theatre Company in Philadelphia, physical theatre company. And Claire trained at um, Lecoq as well. My background in body awareness work of a woman called Elsa Gindler um, with Ava Schmal, a performer in Germany, and Charlotte Selva from the US, and also in Philip Zirilli's martial meditation art. So my background is as a movement practitioner. The source of the story of the idiot colony came from Claire. Claire grew up in the West Midlands, and her dad used to fix hair dryers in hairdressing salons around the region. And one of the hairdressers that he met worked in the salon of St. Margaret's Hospital. And as I'm sure most of you know, um, a lot of these asylums had, had a, a lot of different kind of facilities, and they had their own, some of them had their own hairdressing salons. And the hospital was also known locally as the Great Bar Idiot Colony, which was where the title of the piece came from. The hairdresser told Claire's dad that she cut the hair of these women in the salon inside the hospital who told her stories of people who'd been locked away in the hospital for having illegitimate children. This was the starting point for the project. Who were these women? Why were they locked away? What happened to them? And how what, might we be able to tell their story? So the focus on, of the piece wasn't on mental health as such, but it was focusing on the stories of these women and how they basically became institutionalised through a great a number of years in the hospitals. Um, but we worked very closely with MIND and with Amnesty International through a research process that lasted about a year. So we, we invited writer Lyle Turner to lead this research process for the project, which involved a year of interviewing former staff at St Margaret, who did closed in 1997, local and national archival research and interviews, um, further interviews, 
and work on the wider context of the history of mental health in the UK. And I have got a, ma a big folder of all of the research that we did, which I've left in my office, but I might be able to nip down and bring it so that if anyone's interested to have a look at. Because there's lots about St Margaret's, and so I'll try and do that at lunchtime. What we learned about the 1913 Mental Deficiency Act described four grades of mental defective, and probably some of you know this already. Idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded people, and moral defectives, who were defined as people who, from an early age, displayed some permanent mental defect, coupled with strong, vicious, or criminal propensities on which punishment had little or no effect. Unmarried mothers also became absorbed into this category. So this was the heyday of the large-scale mental asylums, or colonies as they became known. St Margaret's, which was typical of the hospital on the outskirts of many large towns and cities, was housed in a Gothic mansion house in extensive farmland with grounds, including park and lake. And those of you from Exeter might know, do you know Exminster House? Have you been down there? This is where the Environment Agency is, if you know it. So that's, that's Exeter's old Gothic um, mental asylum. Women were committed by their families, often fathers or husbands, for having illegitimate children or because of their sexualities or even for having an affair outside marriage. And this categorisation of moral defective continued until 1959, when the, the 1959 Mental Health Act excluded promiscuity or other immoral conduct alone as grounds for detention. But of course many women, and who knows how many, were completely institutionalised. When the large hospitals then began to be closed down in the 70s and 80s, as the emphasis on care and community replaced large-scale hospitals, many people were released but unable to re rehabilitate. Mm. On our first day of rehearsal, Lyle produced three imagined characters inspired by the research and an A4 sheet of prose for each as a starting point for devising. These characters then became Joy, who was committed by her husband after World War II for having an affair with a black American GI, Mary, who was raped as a teenager and gives birth to an illegitimate baby, who was taken from her. And Victoria, who I played, um, committed by her father for being gay. We each responded to these narrative pieces and created a short solo score of actions, easy, either using the words that Lyle wrote directly or using the words as an impetus to choreograph movement. And there's a lot of physical uh, work in the piece. We then invited Andrew Dawson, who studied dance with Cunningham in New York and is also a Feldenkrais teacher, as well as training in Lecoq as well, to co-create and direct the piece. And he offered an interesting vision and movement perspective on the material. Um, we could only afford him um, to work for part <laughs> of the process, so he would set us devising tasks, which we would then attempt and we'd work on them together when he came back. Uh, but this was quite an interesting way of working. But he was, he was very clear that the research, that this folder, was ours, and he was coming fresh. He wanted to see the, he wanted to see the piece, he wanted to see our bodies, he wanted to, to work with us in the space, and we, and we had the research. So it was, it was kind, of, kind of interesting. We were trying to balance our aims of tell the stories of the characters we created, establish the hairdressing salon as the place where the, these stories began to be revealed, and evoke the sense of the banality of everyday brutality which, which occurred within the hospital. Um, so we wanted to contrast the idea of the hairdressing salon was the place where they had, they were, there, there was tenderness, there was, it was a place of intimacy, there was a very different touch, a quality of, of um, communication, which was very, very different to the, the normal life of the hospital and the interaction with the nurses. Um, so I'm gonna, I just want to show you one piece of the research um, of an incredible film, which some of you may know, possibly many of you, especially Americans, may know, Titty Cup Follies. And if you've come across um, this. Yeah. Whew, it's, a, it's a hell of a piece of, of film, isn't it? Mm. Um, so this is, I'm just going to start it up. while I'm just talking. This was a, this was a documentary um, made in 1967 um, by an American filmmaker, and it was fil called Titty Cup Follies. It was filmed um, at the Massachusetts Correctional Institution of Bridgewater, Massachusetts. And it's a film about the treatment of inmates and patients at this hospital for the criminally insane. 
The title's taken from a talent show performance starring both patients and staff that runs as a thread throughout the film. So this is incredibly relevant to, your, to the idea about performance in asylums. After its initial release, to great critical acclaim, it won lots of awards, it was banned for 25 years because of the brutalities that it portrayed by staff against patients until it was actually the families of some of the inmates brought legal proceedings against uh, Massachusetts State and finally had this film released in 1992. Um, so I'm going to show you the opening two sequences and I'd just really like us to think about this in the context of um, performance in asylums. Who is this performance for? Actual uh, 
sexual uh, relations. So, you get the idea. <clears throat> So that incredible, bizarre, you know, um, marionette kind of um, scene. And then contrast immediately with just the, the everyday treatment of the patient. Um, and it gets a lot more, you've seen it, it gets a lot more graphic and um, shocking. But this, um, this thread of, of the, uh, the talent show what keeps recurring. And the, the guy, the impresario guy, the prison, the prison warder, um, you see this incredible scene later on where he kind of does this impromptu performance, we're talking about performance for the patients. He obviously plays this role of the, of the impresario, with the MC, the compare. Very, very um, odd. And um, yeah, and I was wondering what, well, what's going through the, these inmates' minds during this performance. Some, are, some are seem to be maybe enjoying it, um, that the guard warden relishes his role. Um, you know, what's the power going on there? Um, and the dichotomy between this show and the, daily, the, the, the presentation of the hospital and the daily life, and it, it does become more and more extreme. So I'll, I'll make a copy of this for Anna, in, in, if, if anyone wants to, to watch it who hasn't seen it. But there's an, also an incredible scene later on where one of the, the patients has this in, uh, utterly articulate and same discussion with the doctor trying to convince him that he doesn't need all of this intensive medication which he's been given. Um, and uh, yeah, so it keeps coming back to this. So anyway, d during um, the devising process, we wanted to kind of play on this, this sense of, of, of the kind of dichotomy between the performed and, and the life of the hospital. And you also use it as a, as a device to reveal the story behind one of the characters. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, a brief extract. Thank <laughs> you. 
so the, the use of the birdie song was very much as a, used as a device to kind of place it within the 80s. So everyone from the UK will recognise that song. And the ridiculousness of the music and the Ferrano movement. You saw that the audience immediately laughed when we started doing it. Um, our characters evoking the Titicat Follies have had different reactions to performing. Joy, um, Cassie's character, hates it. Victoria enjoys it, and for Mary it begins as an innocent enjoyment, but then serves as a vehicle to begin to reveal something of her story. We were playing on the sense that, that um, they were being forced to perform this kind of comedic routine and then, and then undercut the expectation of, of comedy when Mary re represents wetting herself with a glass of water, and this triggers a memory of the rape which starts to give clues to her story, which are only revealed at the end. Um, as with the Titty Cup Follies, we wanted to contrast this, this kind of sense of bizarre performance with the mundane routine of the hospital. I'm just going to show you one other short extract of um, a scene which... Uh, this is the last one, Anna. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if I can remember where it is. 13. Um, yeah, so it was about... This is, this is the daily life of the hospital. So I can make it all work. that was, from the point of view of the nurses, incredibly mundane, whereas from the perspective of Victoria, it's a humiliating horror. Um, <clears throat> the sound that accompanies this scene is a mixture of a musical theme composed by Johnny Pilcher, which re recurs alongside Victoria's storyline, and that's laid over a very mundane soundtrack of sounds recorded in a hospital. And that soundtrack, soundtrack also recurs throughout other scenes. Um, there's another scene of a pa the patient simply waiting for medication. Um, and I think that, that this kind of illustrates the theatrical language that we used throughout the devising process and is the, the, our language. We were very, very restricted in terms of set and props, having a very small budget initially, um, so, as we couldn't afford the director. Um, so we had a, a, so all the materials that we had to play with were, were we had a big hood hairdryer from Claire's dad, a small trolley which housed the hairdressing and medical equipment, two buckets and some towels, and we created everything from that. Um, we, and the restriction of that, of course, gave us a lot of opportunity, because the towels became everything, um, and forced us to be, to, to be creative within, within a very limited framework. On one level, it was very simple, this scene, and though it was all about the timing behind the transitions of the towels and the buckets, 
in fact the whole show is about the transition, so tails in the bucket. Um, we often found if we worked around and around an idea, it was very often the, the very simplest way of doing it that we came back to. Um, and it's, I think this scene's also illustrative of the time and space given to each element. As the piece evolved, we wondered if the overall pace was too slow, but I think it, it ended up being one of its strengths. It, it kind of gave a sense of real of time passing, um, and it also allowed space for people to to put their to, to interact with it in a, in a way, which I'll come to in a minute. We had we had a very we had a very positive response to this scene, um, and it was very often nurses in the audience who responded particularly, um, saying how accurate they felt it was. Um, and one nurse at a performance in Stowe told us that, that, that yes, that at these old asylums, the women, where well, these women used to work in the old asylums and now worked in the care and the community setting, women used to share the same water for a bath and the same toothbrush. And this is relatively recent. Um, so I, I'm just going to put together a few concluding thoughts. So to, to return to the audience feedback we received at the beginning, I definitely think, of course, that the subject matter and the stories, known to many from a number of different perspectives, were, was what inherit, inherently connected with people and, and made the piece a success. Um, but I think also the physical language that aided us in the telling of the stories allowed a certain number of people, <coughs> which gave space for these connections to be felt by the audience. And this, this manifested in a number of ways. One we, was the way that the performers played both nurses and patients, allowing for kind of double readings of certain moments of transition between the two personas. You know, the costumes are the same, they just had a little hat to, to kind of indicate that they were nurses. But, but um, a lot of the research that, that we did and talking to people also indicated that, that in these big hospitals, the nurses were often as institutionalised as some of the patients. Um, and so it wasn't a black and white, we, we didn't want to present a kind of black and white distinction. Another was the way that the stories of e each character were culminated. Um, and again, we often found it was the, mo the, si the simplest way to show something that was most effective. For instance, we experimented with a number of ways to show the apex of Mary's story, which was the moment that her baby was taken away from her. And we worked on, we agonised over this for ages. We had text, we, had, we showed her breaking down, um, we showed her kind of struggling with, with, with a nurse over the baby. And what we actually settled on was almost so simple to be thrown away. She simply, she takes a towel, we see her bundle it up, she, looks, she holds it, it's obvious it's a baby. And just for one moment we see her looking at it, and then the towel is just taken away. Mm. And it's become something else. Mm. It was gone in an instant and you know people people were really quite, quite quite kind of struck by that so it was this thing of not kind of not sort of laboring something but just allowing i mean the, the brutality of the of, of what happened is enough in a way it was how to how to work with with that just very very simply um at the end of the piece joy who is always waiting for the return of her american lover is lobotomized using hairdressing materials um, Victoria drowns herself in the lake, which was based on an actual event at Great Bar. And Mary is simply shown tidying up the mess in the hairdressing salon, almost reconciled to a life inside the institution. The final image is of the three figures' faces being covered by hair, their stories once again disappearing. So we made the piece because we wanted to work together, <coughs> to integrate and assimilate our range of skills and training to, to try and tell the story. This, or this beginning of a story that, that Claire's dad found out. And beyond that, we hadn't really planned. None of us expected the piece to, to have the kind of long life that it, that it ended up having. And I think that was due in part to the reasons I've, I've talked about. We were attempting to capture a particular episode in the history of institutionalised care in the heyday of the idiot colonies, but one which certainly still has resonance for many people in the present day. Should we have a couple of questions while I set up the DVD, if you still want to watch Cracking Up, and then we can have a more uh, discussion at the end, reflecting on both pieces. Rebecca, was there any dialogue in this, or was it entirely... No, there was. There was, yes, there was a lot. 
yeah, it was a kind of balance between the two. Um, and it was an interesting process as well because the writer um, who we worked with, who also um, took responsibility for a lot of the research, his way of communicating was in words. And the, the three of us have a more physical background and it was how those two things met in the rehearsal room and what words actually, what words needed to be spoken and what needed to be shown and what the balance between the, the two the two areas were. Mm. So um, it was it was quite it was quite a tricky, tricky yeah mm. kind of balance that we that we worked on. Can I ask you about your storytellers? Um, did you engage with the people whose stories you're retelling? Or were they stories that you found from other sources that you read? The stories in themselves were fiction. They were composites. Okay. So the, th the so the three characters were completely fictional. Yeah. Okay. But they were but they were drawn from from material that we found. We didn't manage to speak to any of the women who were themselves locked up. Um, many of them were, you know, the, the, the period that we were looking at was so locked up in the in the 1940s. Um, but we did speak to people who who knew of it, who knew of them, and a lot of people who worked there, and mm -hmm. also um, mental health service users through Mind, who, who, who talked to us about you know the, their connections with uh, with those institutions, and uh, yeah, and the whole the whole idea of, of the being completely vulnerable and, and the stories being lost. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you? Oh, if you can. It, it, about your rehearsal process. So yeah. did you develop your character on your own and then come into the room and then what happened? What did you do in the room? Well, it's, that's an interesting one. We, so we started with those four pieces, th three pieces of prose mm -hmm. and those became um, three little kind of individual scores, individual kind of sequences of movement. Mm -hmm. um, my character, the journey of my character was different to the other two because my, the director just proposed very early on that my character never spoke. So um, so my story was told entirely through movement or through reported speech and and I think that was that was quite fitting to the way that you know if, if these stories were told within the institutions they were they weren't heard and they certainly you know and this is the whole sense about what was articulated and we had this, this sense that yeah, the work with the hairdressers, somehow, you know, you end up telling the hairdresser things that you, you might not, and, and the, yeah, so the hairdresser is a kind of catalyst. But we then, um, the director basically set us different tasks, so we, so we wanted to have a scene, we wanted to have a scene where Victoria was bathed, so let's just try and do it. Um, we want to show a lobotomy. God, how do you do that? You know, <laughs> and so let's try and do the impossible. A lot of what he set us was, you know, okay, go away and come back next week and just to do a lobotomy. And it was, it was like, oh my God, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and try and be true, try and be true, true to to to, to be factually accurate, accurate. Um, so it was a kind of it, it was a it was a constant interplay really. And then the love the writer would bring in pieces of text. We'd try things out in dialogue. We tried, you know, receiving a treatment, um, and we all always had this this sort of sense. Well, this is what happened to the, these are the lines of the three characters. We need to tell these stories. So, how do those three things layer on top of each other? Is that? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. So, so it was a kind of interplay between, yeah, between devising, writing, directing pieces. And then, yes, and then a lot of the use of great big rolls of wallpaper. Uh, the director was very keen on that. You know, and, and then <laughs> shuffling pieces of paper around. To, to, uh, and because it was very fragmented in the way that the stories were kind of laying, layering into each other and overlapping, um, the structure was very kind of, was one of the most difficult things to find in a way. Um, but I think that, that kind of suited the, the, the material as well. Can I, can I just say that it was brilliant, brilliantly conceived, I think, and uh, very effective. Um, is, is, the, is your piece, is that available, available on Vimeo mm. or anything for yeah, teaching I could, purposes? Yes, yes, definitely. I could definitely um, I could make a copy of the whole, the whole um, show. Um, yeah, yeah, I I <laughs> your creativity with props. Fabulous. I'm glad you didn't show the baby. 
Yeah. It, it sounds a bit too much. Sounds like I mean the titty cuts. Ah. Yeah. It's just very hard to watch if you, you know, had any contact with that kind of world. It's, yeah. it's horrible. And it reminds me a little bit of Winterbourne, uh, the the um, the abuse of uh, the um, clients at Winterbourne Hospital recently. And I, I was I was struck um, watching that. I mean, it's very hard for anybody to watch who cares about people. Of course yeah. not. And fortunately, uh, not everything in uh, mental health services been, has been abusive or learning disabilities. But the use of props uh, in exacting abuse, you know, the way the guy sat on a chair over one of the clients, it, it, it struck me then that. The, the abuse going on is very much a performance. They, they, they seem to be getting a, a response from one another, the, the, the staff, in, in, uh, in performing and entertaining themselves yeah. uh, with, with the patients. And, and I think your, your film kind of pushes uh, ideas around that. Uh, That's, yeah, absolutely. And have you seen The Harm of the Titty Cut Follies? Um, I saw the worst bits, and I have to say, quite a few of. Um, it was the Madness and Literature Conference last year that we did, right. and one of the speakers was Tess Jones from the uh, uh, University of um, Columbia. Yeah. Uh, De Denver. Oh, Denver. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Um, and she showed this, but she did give a warning, and, and a few colleagues I know who had. Uh, family members with mental health uh, difficulties. Uh, a lot of them, I looked around the room, uh, and a lot of them simply wouldn't look and couldn't look. Uh, very no. hard to take that. Is absolutely, mm -hmm. and uh, you're absolutely right with, in terms of the performance for each other with this, the staff, and I think that and that becomes even clearer later on in the in the Titty Got Follies. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious about, you said it taught, I was curious about your audiences and uh, uh, if it, it's kind of, if you perform in front of kind of, uh, I suppose, service users or people that have suffered from any um, of the issues and been confronted or, or what was the response from different yeah. audiences? Well, we, we never had a negative response from anyone we invited. We, we work very closely with Mind and the mm. producers, Turkey Key. Um, who also do, do separate amounts of work with mental health service users invited. We work very closely with local um, bodies to make sure that because we talk, I think it was about 100 shows that we did. And we, we always had very, very positive responses from people, um, mental health service users, who, yeah, who, people who said, thank you for telling our story. And it, yeah, and it, it kind of constantly. I don't know. It, it, in a way, the more, the, the further on that we went with the tour, the more. I don't know. It was a very, it was different. It was a very difficult piece to perform, and it was, and it was. We were constantly amazed and very, very moved by the responses that we had from people, and in post-show discussions as well, people wanting, wanting to to talk about their experiences and and feeling that they could share them, and feeling that, yeah. Wanting to have a dialogue about it, basically, and it was just, yeah, I'm not being very articulate. It was a very moving process to, to meet all of these people, um, yeah, who, who talked to us about what their stories. I just want to say, I, yeah. it's beautiful. I'm so struck by it. But two things that I saw and you said mm -hmm. make so much sense to me: the time that you took and the physical language seems to allow in. I feel like I can, even watching it on tape, that I can be there with it instead of having stuff coming at me. Because I think of oh, just a piece in particular that's a sort of confessional piece about child abuse that, that I found very just off-putting. I feel for the woman, but it's like uh, there is no space. Mm -hmm. There's something so spacious. I just really appreciate it as an audience, and I think it's beautiful. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think you're right. I think that that, that was one of the ways which, yeah, it, uh, it allowed people to interact and to have space to, to respond and to, um, yeah, to be with you. To yeah. Be, yeah, I think so. Beautiful. Mm.
can ask a question about the yeah. interplay between um, factual, empirical data and imagi imagining and imagination and how those two things sort of work together in your mm. process. Because I always find that really fascinating and how, um, how freed up you are by your research and how restricted you feel as a, as a maker, I suppose. Yeah, it was always, so it was always a balance. Um, we, 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 ha we did several periods of rehearsals over kind of, we had the first year of research and then we, we kind of did a few weeks here and a few weeks there. And yeah, and we had this, this, this blue folder which, was, which we carried around with us everywhere, which was in the room. And we, we kind of, I don't know, our relationship to the folder was, was kind of, was, I don't know, was, where, was it even sort of physical about where the folder was in the room on a particular day and how we, we all, we talked about having, feeling like we, we had a responsibility and we wanted to, to um, work with integrity about, you know, in the, the relationship between, between those stories, but we also wanted to, to play and, and it's, it, so, so, yeah, so, so we deliberately used f fictional, you know, we created characters, but um, it was a kind of constant process of circling around those. So, so we used little pieces of, we worked with, uh, there was a, a list of rules in the institution. We improvised around those, those rules using, using the, the, the words themselves, but then actually a kind of creative decision was then to leave the words away and not use them. Um, so it, yeah, it kind of it really varied, but it's it, it, yeah, you you know yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say anything about how you you work with them. <coughs> oh, it's just you can know it. it this has to be a process of imagining, doesn't there? I think alongside the the research because it was just about the research. You could just lay that out and allow people. To, to read it, so there is the process of translation that has to happen, I think, and uh, what we became quite interested in with, <laughs> with the show this afternoon is the two years that, that Henry forgot, that sort of no longer exist, and are sort of no longer documented, because there's about 11,900 scientific journals on Henry, and 33.5 <laughs> million hits on Google, oh there's an awful lot that you can yeah. read about him, so <laughs> what we need to explore is, is the part that you can't research then, mm -hmm. the part that we have to imagine, <coughs> the part entirely forgotten from history, and the part where all the relatives that would know about that no longer are alive, so that became a source of, it sort of became about trying to find the gaps I suppose in the research, whereas theatre makers, maybe we could use our skills to in some way help to rebuild it in, in some way. But I always find that interesting, it is different, but there is that sense of, weighty sense of responsibility yeah. as well, of trying to um, be true to the materials that you found and trying to be um, honest and not mislead. And so it's, it's a complicated balance, I think, trying to find the, the two things. But I'm fascinated by your blue folder though. I, uh, <laughs> uh, the positioning of that, yeah. that object in the room is, is yeah. a fascinating thing, I think. Yeah. And it, the physicalisation of that responsibility, I'm really fascinated by yeah. your process. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. I think there's something interesting as well in terms of um, <coughs> that relationship between testimony or whatever, you know, the evidence and what you imagine during a creative process. And what I strikes me about both Beachy Head and the Idiot Colony it is that your responsibility almost to not be able to imagine everything mm -hmm. that you give yourself over to the fact that you don't know this experience mm -hmm. you can't own it um, and therefore to try and translate it into a straightforwardly communicable experience is is inaccurate and so you you stage the the impossibility of pain mm -hmm. Uh, that you can't that which cannot be articulated, and I think that's really interesting in the performance of um, mental health and private experience. The kind of the necessity of a poria within those kind of works. Um, that's absolutely mm -hmm. right. I think they are. And we, we just we have this device of the bell, the alarm bell, which came in at the end of the trailer. And uh, which was, you know, which was obviously marking the time through the day. But we also used it as a, you know, if things, <coughs> if something starts to go wrong, if the pa the patient starts to transgress too much, the bell goes. And we kind of played with that as you, we, we, you can only show so much the bell goes. Mm -hmm. What happens when the bell goes? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that kind of space of, of like the alarm, the alarm. What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. And that which can't be said, I went to see, it, not straightforwardly relevant, but went to see a production of Faith, The Faith Healer. And what's so good about that piece is it's these three monologues and they're all circling around. They all tell the same mm -hmm. story, albeit different versions, but they're all hovering around that which they can't say. And that's that's the story that haunts you, and that it, it's what cannot be put into language, I think. And that's where theatre performance, again, is interesting in terms of um, the inarticulacy of the experience. Does that make any sense? I think, I think there are some ethical issues. I found the madness and literature stuff that we've been doing, a lot of ethical issues were coming up around, <coughs> um, you know, misery literature, uh, a lot of literature, in fact, most, most literature is about madness, if you, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to actually differentiate. Um, and ethically, one wonders about the, the, the crossover between abuse, representations of abuse, representations of uh, suffering as, in, as entertainment. And obviously, dramatically, you know, uh, things which are, you know, dark, uh, disturbing and so on, it, it makes for great material for fiction and for drama. What, what gets lost in that, though, I do worry about, which is um, all the compassionate engagements yeah. that do happen despite some of the rather awful people that sometimes care mm -hmm. for people in our communities and 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 the the, the happy stuff if you like yeah. writes itself mm -hmm. out yeah. the the modeling of compassion <laughs> writes itself out mm -hmm. and a lot of representation gets quite caught up with um past uh, uh kind of contexts of mental mm. health care. The mm. asylum becomes a stage, becomes a prop for writers mm. uh, and a prop for entertainment. And, and so I have some real ethical concerns on these things. I think there's a, a shift as well, um, which is something that I'm exploring in my book, is the asylum or mental health or madness. Um, as a metaphor, and you get that, um, as um, you talk about in your book, that mm -hmm. in Ibsen and people, madness functions as a metaphor for all kinds of other ills, mm -hmm. or problems, or social concerns. But I think in recent times, last 20, 30 years, you begin to see a different approach, which is about a staging of pathology and about mental ill health and a, it's a different form madness isn't standing in for something else to expose you know social uh, unease about something else if that makes sense it is about itself and so that's interest an interesting development in terms of um, theatricality and, and health and medicine how do you translate science into aesthetics and I think that is an interesting move that happens away from mm -hmm madness as metaphor and madness as lived experience and attending to that lived experience and um, and it's interesting um, about the you know those like you said those compassionate encounters um, it's just an anecdotal thing but my brother who's a psych nurse and his um, wife is a psychiatrist and they went to see the wonderful world of dissocia I don't know if you know it um, and that the first act is this sort of um, almost Alice in Wonderland meets David Lynch, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> a woman goes to the land of Dissocia to reclaim her lost hour um, from the lost property office there. Um, and then the second act opens in a, in a um, psychiatric hospital. And my brother and um, his wife Anne both said, that Anthony Nielsen in the note to the play is very clear, he's like, they are not inhuman, horrible nurses who are cold and shitty. Um, they're just at work and they're just, you know, saying the routine and the need for black humour and just getting on with it. Um, but my brother said that it, seeing that place changed his practice at work, not because he's cruel and horrible, <laughs> but because he sometimes forgets, you know, that it is a, I can't remember who was saying that it's, it's just a functional space, I'm doing what I'm doing and, you know, just simple things like giving somebody their meds and then walking out. And it, forgetting that this might be a lived space for somebody for a while or 
Um, I think you were just saying yeah about the, the nurses just getting on mm. with it, but where's the, the character yeah. show yeah. was it? Um, Victoria. Victoria. Mm. This is a systematically unpleasant yeah. experience and he said that's really stuck with him so again it goes back to those questions of what theatre can do in terms of policy or perception or... But, but there's, I think there's something interesting from my perspective that runs through all of this is that obviously when, when you are creating these pieces you're drawing on representations and ideas and yet also being aware of the fact that you're going to be contributing to existing representations and ideas as well, what you're saying about you know, not, not being able to say everything, leaving some, because inevitably people are going to come with their own ideas about madness, about asylum, whatever it might be, and, and your performance is going to be changing that in, in some way or contributing to that in some way, but how that change is going to happen is going to be you know, very different in different situations, so I think it's very interesting thinking about how we draw on these representations, but also... Well. I think mm. madness as a concept is so, so vast mm. that, I mean, you know, it has changed recently because, you know, since around sort of the 19th century, it's been increasingly medicalised. Um, but, you, you know, that's maybe, you maybe lost the sense of madness having value for itself, which, which you used to have. If you look in the 18th century, even 17th century, you get portrayals of, I mean, the, the Fool, for example, in King Lear is a very you know, good example where you know, there's some sort of wisdom coming through madness. But we, we've, it's, so, it's become so pathologized now that that's sort of, you know, it's, 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 you have to be very specific. Um, but I, I, so I, I find when I see portrayals of psychiatric nurses, kind of, uh, <coughs> I mean, a good, a good example recently is Shatter Island. Where if you, I don't know if anyone sees yeah. Shutter Island, but portrayal of psychiatric nurses. I mean, you'd never want to be a psychiatric nurse if you went, you know, through that because they're they're all emotionally dead, deadened and kind of brutal. And um, I mean, I would say this because I'm a psychiatric nurse, but I mean, we aren't all like that. And there is a lot of goodwill, you know, within mental health services and to kind of. Uh, you know, do, do do what you can to, to, to help people. Um, and, 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 and a lot of the time, I, I think portrayals don't really, haven't really got to that point. That they, they, they are often historical and, you know, but that, that, that's one thing. And then, then, then the case is, as, as you've done, you know, you have to try and be accurate and that's difficult and that's, you know, there's a lot of sort of tension in that. Um, but yeah, same. Something that interests me a lot is sort of the, the opacity of behavior that we consider mad, that's pathologized, and, and sort of not, not now in terms of the nurse or the establishment, but, but people themselves. There's a play that's just been in New York through Glass Darkly that looks at a, a young woman's breakdown, but very much from opening what is her experience so that, that she has the subject position and it's, I think that's different than, or, or you were talking about 4.48 psychosis where the, the subject, the person writing, the voice, the, the character is going through something and there's an attempt to understand that in a way the same as what we saw as opposed to sort of the standing outside which earlier portrayals were where, you know, here's this mad behavior and it's opaque to the rest of us. But this, this trying to get inside, to me, is a really worthy endeavor to try to understand, no, nothing's our own behavior, but there's a continuum and, and we recognize behaviors and what seems like way out there. I mean, that's just so bizarre that somebody does whatever it is, you know, obsessive, compulsive, or whatever. But as writers, as actors, just unpeeling that and, and, and looking about what it means to be inside an experience, although we'll never catch all of it any, I can barely know what my own experience is, much less anyone else's, but, but to begin to touch on that, I think is in itself a really worthy endeavor. It's, it gets negative, I think, when it gets stereotypical and judgmental and not compassionate. But I think that's true in it, you know, I mean, we can all make nurse ratchets or whatever out of, you know, it, 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 those are like great ways to satirize and to no way really give honest due to what... It's quite hard to, to create a balanced portrayal, I think, because mm -hmm. we haven't really worked out what we want mm -hmm. services to be as a society, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, you know, mm -hmm. when your experience, my experience of sort of being a family member and then going in... Um, going into sort of the professional response is you, you've got to 
it's a sort of soup <coughs> of different approaches. You know, on the one hand you've got psychiatry, on the one hand you've got, on the other hand you've got, you know, um, psychology and all the kind of CBT stuff that's coming through that. Then you've got kind of the idea that, that um, the people that have had the, the negative experiences should, should be able to sort of reclaim them for themselves and, and, and actually become a part of, of, of you know, working part of the system, which I think they've done in America yes. already. Yes. If there's a movement no. in America to get people involved. And they, they were talking about doing that in Cambridge as well. And I don't know where they're at now. But, um, and, and then you've got uh, sort of art therapists and, you know, it's a huge kind of, it's quite jumbled up. And, and, and it's also coming out of the legal system, which has, you know, had a lot of problems in the past. Mm -hmm. in, and certainly in the UK, you know, the, you know, well, as your piece is saying, and the, you know, with the, the idiot problem, um, and, and and that's still carrying on today. I mean, some of the sections are ludicrous. I think, you know, they really are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm.